So we are going to talk about proof by induction on the real numbers. Now you might have seen proof by induction being done on the natural numbers or the integers. In that case, we talk about it like this. Let s be a subset of the non-negative integers. Now we want this set s to satisfy two conditions. The first condition is that zero is inside of the set. And the second condition is that if n is in the set, then n plus 1 is also in the set. Now if s satisfies both of these conditions, then s in fact contains every non-negative integer. And the reason that this is true is pretty straightforward. We know that 0 is in the set by this first condition. With the second condition, let's take n equals 0. Then this says 0 in s implies 1 in s. So therefore 1 is also in the set. But if we apply this condition again with n equals 1, then 1 in s implies 2 in s. Okay, so 0, 1, and 2 are in the set. But if 2 is in s, then 3 is in s, and that implies 4 is in s, that implies 5 is in s, and so on. So we can prove that any non-negative integer will be in the set. Now, this formulation of induction seems to rely on the fact that we're working with the integers and we can count them 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 to get through the entire set. But in fact, there's a way to do induction even when we're working with the real numbers where there are uncountably many elements to prove the statement. Now in this video, I'm just going to focus on real induction on the closed interval from 0 to 1. But these same ideas can be extended to any closed interval from a to b on the real numbers, and even to intervals that go off to infinity. So let's take a look at the formulation of real induction. Instead of considering a subset of the non-negative integers, we're considering a subset s of the closed interval from 0 to 1 on the real numbers. And this time we have three conditions. The first condition is that 0 is in the set, just like before. The second condition will take a little bit more work. The second condition for real induction is that if we have some element of the set that's less than 1, then we must have a closed interval x comma y that's a subset of s for some y greater than x. So this is saying that for any number x that's in the set, we will always have a closed interval that starts at x and ends somewhere bigger than x where that entire closed interval is contained in s. And the third condition is that if we have a half open interval that starts at 0 and ends at some x, where this entire half open interval is in s, then that end point x, that final end point, has to be in the set as well. So if all three of these conditions are satisfied, then that set s is the entire closed interval from 0 to 1. So you can see how this definition is somewhat analogous to the definition of induction on the integers. We start out by saying that the least element has to be in the set, that 0 in s condition is the same in both cases. And really the idea of induction on the integers is we want to say, well if one number is in s, then a number that's a little bit bigger is also in s. And from there, we can sort of march forward 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 to get to every integer. In this case, of course, we can't just say x plus 1 is in s because there are infinitely many numbers between x and x plus 1. But what we can do is say, well, if we're starting at x being in this set, then we can march forward a little bit from x to something a little bit bigger than x. This could be just x plus epsilon, something very small, but it has to be bigger than x and this lets us move forward and this whole interval is still in the set. And this third condition is there to solve the problem of the real numbers where we could have a set that contains 9 tenths and 99 hundredths and 999 thousandths and so on, but it doesn't contain 1. So this last condition says, well, if the set contains everything up to x, then it has to include x itself as well. So now we are going to prove real induction. In other words, we're going to prove that if some subset of the closed interval from 0 to 1 satisfies these three conditions, then it must be the entire interval. In order to do that proof, we're going to define a new set. We're going to call it A, and we'll define A as the points x 
in the closed interval from zero to one, such that the entire set zero to X is contained in S. Now, remember our goal is to prove that S equals the entire open interval from zero to one. In other words, we wanna prove that zero comma one is a subset of S. So our goal is to prove that one is an element of A, because by definition, that means that zero comma one is contained in S. So I moved the definition of A to give us some more space and let's get started with the proof. The first thing I'm going to do is define a number M, which is the supremum of A. So recall that the definition of supremum is it's the least upper bound. So it's the smallest number that's bigger than every number in A. Now we know that this supremum M exists for two reasons. First of all, we assumed that zero is an element of the set, which means that the closed interval from zero to zero is a subset of S, and that means that zero is in A. So this set A is non-empty. And second of all, we're only taking numbers X from zero to one, so the set is also bounded. And every non-empty bounded set will have a supremum, which means that M exists. Now, the first thing I wanna prove is that the interval from zero to M half open is a subset of S. In other words, we want to prove that every number smaller than M is an element of S. In order to do that, Remember that M is the least upper bound on A. So let's suppose that Y is in this interval from zero to M. Well, that means that Y is greater than or equal to zero and that it's less than M. Now, because M is the least upper bound on our set A, we know that Y is not an upper bound on A because if Y were an upper bound that's less than M, M wouldn't be the least upper bound. Because Y is not an upper bound on A, there has to be an element of A that's bigger than Y. So there exists some Z in A such that Z is greater than Y. But what does it mean for Z to be an element of A? Well, by definition, that means that the closed interval from zero to Z is a subset of S. And in particular, Z is greater than Y, so that means that the closed interval from zero to Y is a subset of S. So we just showed that for any Y less than M, the interval from zero to Y is a subset of S. And because we can do that for any Y, we know that every Y between zero and M is an element of S. And that's exactly this statement right here. Every Y between zero and less than M is a subset of S. Now here's the thing. We have the third condition on real induction, which says that if this half open interval from zero to M is a subset of S, then that implies that point M itself has to be in S as well. Now this assumes that X is greater than zero, but if M is equal to zero here, then of course the point zero is in S because that's the first condition. So this gives us that M is in S. And from here, we can use this second condition. If M is in S and it's less than one, then some closed interval from M to a point Y has to be a subset of S for Y greater than M. So using the second condition, we get that the closed interval from M to Y is a subset of S for some value of Y that's bigger than M. And now let's put all of these conditions together. The half open interval from zero to M, that's contained in S. And the closed interval from M to Y, that's also contained in S. So if we put these two statements together, the entire closed interval from zero to Y is contained in S. And by definition up here, that implies that Y is an element of A. But that's a problem because we said that M was the supremum of A, which means that M is an upper bound on A. Every element of A has to be equal to or smaller than M. 
but now we have a value bigger than m that's in a. That's a contradiction, so our assumption must have been wrong. What assumption did we make? Well, the one assumption we made was when we applied this second condition, which says that if x is in s, then some closed interval x comma y is also contained in s. This condition requires that x is less than 1. That's the assumption we made, is we assumed that m was less than 1. So in other words, doing this proof, we found that if m is less than 1, we obtain a contradiction. And that means the only remaining possibility is that m is equal to 1. And from our earlier work, we know that the half-open interval from 0 to m is contained in s, and that also means that m is contained in s. So if m equals 1, that means that the entire closed interval from 0 to 1 is contained in s, and that gives us our final result. So that's how we prove real induction on a closed interval. Using these three conditions, if we can prove that these are satisfied for a subset of the closed interval from 0 to 1, then that subset has to contain all of the numbers in the interval. And we can use this to do proofs that are very similar to induction, even when we're working with the real numbers, where we look locally and we say, OK, prove that 0 is in the set, and prove that if a number is in the set, then some set, some interval of numbers a little bit bigger is also contained in the set. We do this half open interval condition as well, which is if all the numbers up to a point are in the set, then that point at the edge is also in the set. And if we have those conditions, that's enough to prove that we're looking at the entire interval. I'll give credit to a paper by Pete L. Clark for giving me this idea about real induction. You can check his paper in the description if you'd like to find out more.